continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind, and my guest today has recently accepted an extraordinarily challenging and now possibly quite controversial new position, that of Dean of Columbia University's noted Graduate School of Journalism, the J School, as I knew it in my undergraduate days at Columbia College. Well now, interestingly enough, those very words fall under the general heading the more things change, the more they stay the same. For word, for word, for word. That's precisely the way I introduced the first of two Open Mind programs with Columbia's then new J School Dean exactly 10 years ago. Historian, author, New Yorker writer and journalist, Nicholas Lemon became Columbia's journalism dean then, retires now, even as today's Open Mind guest Historian, author, New Yorker writer, and journalist Steve Cole takes on that ever greater challenge of pointing the way to be a journalist even as all things change and we change with them. Steve Cole spent many years at the Washington Post as a general assignment feature writer, as financial correspondent, as a foreign correspondent, and the paper's South Asia bureau chief. Together with a Washington Post colleague, my guest won the 1990 Pulitzer Prize for explanatory reporting, eventually became an associate editor and then the Post's managing editor. In 2005, Steve Cole joined the writing staff of The New Yorker based in Washington, D.C. In 2007, he also joined the New America Foundation, resigning as its president five years later. Now he is Dean Cole, and it is about his new academic challenges that I most want to talk today. Perhaps next time we can get to his various brilliant New Yorker articles and his prize-winning books, such as The Bin Ladens, such as Private Empire, Exxon Mobil, and American Power, such as Ghost Wars, which in 2005 won a second Pulitzer for my guest. So I should ask Dean Cole, What's first on your academic agenda? Well, I've got a lot uh, to learn in my first year, and I really intend to spend the first months listening and, and learning from the faculty who I am just barely getting to know as I get ready to come in. But I think you framed it well uh, in your opening. Journalism is in a state of flux. It has been for most of the last 10 years. It has, you could argue, been for longer than that in different ways, driven by technological changes, the advent of radio, then the advent of television, now the advent of digital technology. Journalism is always being challenged to define itself as a profession, to define its role in our democracy, and to answer for young people who want to enter into the field, what is it that I need to know what kind of career can I expect to have? And the school plays a very large role in those, in those latter areas. And so I, I want to make sure uh, that I come in with a kind of Hippocratic attitude. I, I know the school is in very good shape. Nick, uh, you also mentioned, did a terrific job in his 10 years as dean. And so I'm, I'm not going to go in there and smash the windows and, and uh, declare revolution. But I do think that a school in a field like this has to keep moving. It has to keep adapting. 
And I would say there are two areas where I'm most focused uh, to, to sort things out in my own mind over the first year. Uh, one is, uh, of course, the relationship between journalism and changing technology, changing ways of telling stories, of gathering facts, of communicating with the public, of playing a role, holding power to account, and speaking on behalf of populations that are marginalized in our democracy. Technology is neutral as to all of those values of journalism, but if journalism is to survive, it must adapt to this technology in order to carry out those roles. So that's one. What is it that we're doing in the classroom to equip our students to meet that challenge? That's one question. And then a second one is uh, related to the way the world is changing and therefore a university like Columbia, about 30 percent, maybe more, of the typical class at the J School now is from abroad. And uh, that's not unusual at, at major universities in this country anymore. We have the good fortune of attracting the best and brightest from all over the world. But I think it's important for journalism and for the school to think of this window on the rest of the world's journalism, not just as some kind of coincidence or business model where we attract students and they pay tuition and go home, but actually as fundamental to the way we think about the role journalism plays today. We're in a smaller and smaller world, and frankly, quite a lot of the most exciting journalism that's being practiced in the world today is being practiced outside the United States in societies that are in, uh, in motion, where there are sometimes violent events as in Syria, sometimes subtler contests between authoritarian governments and populations as in the People's Republic of China. And to think about um, the values and the, and the pedagogy at a university like Columbia on a global scale, and to think also about the experiences our students have as a global opportunity rather than just uh, one in New York and the United States is something I'm very interested in. Now, you said a moment ago that technology is neutral. Do you really mean that? Don't you think that the technological advances, no, strike that, changes that have occurred since Nick was here 10 years ago and shortly before then, that there is something inherent in the um, use of the web itself in going into the clouds that does change so fundamentally that it's not just a matter of neutrality. Well, I meant that technology doesn't have values. Technology is structure. Structure is not neutral. Structure is changing. And, and each technology that affects the way we communicate with one another, the way we gather information, the way information is exchanged in our democracy, each changing form of technology does have implications. You might attribute values to those implications. But it's, it's not because the technology has ideas about itself. It has a structure. And the structure of the internet, say for example in comparison to television, is profoundly different and it is changing the way media work, the way consumers engage with media. And one of the obvious characteristics of this change is that it has empowered individuals at the expense of hierarchies. It has created a collapse in the barriers to entry into journalism. Now anyone who wants to make an interview show doesn't require a wonderful television studio like the one we're sitting in here at CUNY, they can go into their basement and with a relatively cheap digital video uh, system um, carry out television work and then post it on YouTube for free and if they can f figure out how to reach an audience, market themselves. So, now, so this has, you know, this is a change in structure rather than uh, a change in some sort of intention. But with that description I could ask for good or for bad, and I know better than that because you have to say for both. Both, yes. But what's good and what's bad about what you okay. just described? So what's good is that um, it has democratized media and journalism. It what does has, that mean? It means that it's much more uh, accessible uh, to ordinary um, citizens in, in ways that uh, journalism was when printing presses weren't so expensive and business models weren't basically the monopolies that newspapers grew up to be in the post-war period. There are lots more opportunities for individuals to create journalism, to act as journalists, to train themselves and to, and to play a role um, in, our, in our culture, in our democracy, than was the case when, for example, television was dominated by license spectrum and a handful of networks. The business models were very expensive. Newspapers required um, printing presses that cost hundreds of millions of dollars a year 
a year and systems of distribution of those newspapers that were also very expensive. Today, the barriers to entry in media have fallen. And so the system is much more open. However, what's bad, mm. on the other side of that coin, um, a collapse in uh, professional uh, confidence, professional standards, professional review that had grown up almost as an accident of history in the business models of the post-war period. These, these business models shaped in part by the barriers to entry and the scarcity of spectrum and the, and the sort of monopoly positions of newspapers. Behind those walls, professions formed, values were uh, sort of propagated, a sort of peer-to-peer professional set of ideas and standards about the best of journalistic practice evolved. It had a uh, counterpart in academia and universities. Those same values were taught in the academy and then migrated into professional life, similar to law, similar to medicine, not to say flawless, but still an aspiration to kind of professional standards and accountability even that is now under uh, pressure because the business models that housed those values have also collapsed with the same barriers to entry we were talking about before. So you essentially are in a transition where it's much less clear than it was 10 years ago, never mind 20 years ago, who is a journalist, uh, what professional journalism amounts to, where are the borders between professional activity and amateur activity, what are best practices, do we have a consensus in our culture among consumers of journalism, never mind practitioners, about what they expect by way of excellent professional practice, what excellence actually is anymore. And I think that is problematic. But of course you, you give me the opening there to ask you, is it a profession? Do you think of journalism as a profession? Which is a question that I put so frequently to my journalist guests. I do, I, and I recognize that it's, uh, you know, it's a position that I would have to l argue like a lawyer, that it's not, it's not self-evident. But I'd make two uh, points about it. First, it's clearly a profession in the sense that objectively it evolved from 1945 until, until 2000 in the manner of a profession. It had professional associations, it had a professional uh, culture in which excellence was defined uh, through kind of peer-to-peer -peer accountability and, and it, an attempt to publish standards, a clear sense of what uh, the codes of practice were. It didn't have licensing like law and medicine, but it had a form of legitimizing that was located in professional practice at the, at the major institutions. And I, so I would say that um, while it wasn't a government regulated profession, it evolved into a profession. Now, um, so that's one observation I would make, it, but that's probably not as important as the other aspect of this, which is, is there a form of professional conduct that journalism um, requires or that is innate to journalism or should be um, an aspiration for journalists. Now that's more, to me, debatable because it's not just an observation about a certain period of history. It's a question about the nature of journalism itself. Is it something that should require um, these kinds of ethical codes, uh, forms of pure accountability, and professional standards and teaching. Do you think it should? Obviously, I'm the dean of the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, I think that it must. But I recognize that this claim is contested now in a way that it wasn't 20 years ago, and for good reason. Partly because of journalism's own failures, partly because of the profession's own failures, and partly because of these changes that have opened up the, acts, the, the, the practice of journalism to all sorts of people who don't believe they require any um, supervision or access to these professional ideas or, or uh, s sort of standards and codes that, that the, the profession has styled itself on. Um, why? Because um, there is a difference, it seems to me, um, not just in our society, and, but in lots of other settings around the world, if you if you want to think about it in comparative politics terms, there is a difference between the form of accountability and transparency that professional journalism can provide uh, to create, to hold power to account 
to hold politicians in check, to hold private uh, corporations uh, to account, to uh, provide citizens with the kind of information they need to, to exercise their franchise, uh, to motivate them to, to, um, to take action by providing them with facts that would otherwise not be available to them. That to carry out that role, if, if, if we could agree that some function like that is what the founders had in mind when they enfranchised journalism through the First Amendment, what I would argue is that in order to achieve that objective to the greatest possible extent with all of the flaws and all of the noise and all of the opinion mongering that masquerades as journalism, that that, that function actually does require a level of professional achievement that is not as difficult as neurosurgery but is more difficult than acquiring a real estate license. I mean, it is, it is, a, it is, a, it is hard work, and it requires uh, training and a peer culture and resources and, and also institutions with resources to withstand the resistance that strong journalism often stirs up but in the form of lawsuits or other forms of pressure. But now, how does what you just said, and what you just said was quite wonderful, how does that uh, parse alongside the democratizing that you spoke of? Every man is a journalist. Right. Every well, woman a, is a journalist. This is, the, this is the fundamental tension of the time that we're in. Um, and by observing that the barriers to entry have fallen and that there is much greater access to the practice of journalism, I don't mean to say that I celebrate every aspect of that or that I'm, in, or that I'm enshrining in my own mind, you know, sort of reifying the amateur. And there is a tendency today in discourse about journalism to, to celebrate um, the entry of the crowd into journalism, to say that crowdsourcing, for example, this practice of essentially using the tool of the internet to, to uh, poll uh, all consumers and users of a, of a medium uh, for information or for journalistic insight, that somehow this is an advance. I don't think so. To me, uh, it, it is just a change that has both dangerous aspects and, and potentially um, positive aspects. But the potentially positive ones, to my mind, um, have to be measured against these other aspirations for journalism. So if, if, if you tell me that you can cite a model where the practice of amateur participation in journalism is advancing these goals we surrounded before, described before, and maybe we could add some to that list, um, then I'll, I'll say that's a good change. And I, I can think of one example. Um, let's, let's um, please. One of the functions of journalism is to bear witness. Uh, and that is when um, atrocities occur, when um, uh, marginalized populations are victimized, when governments um, use their monopoly of violence to kill their own citizens. It is a function of journalism to call account, to, call witness, to bear witness to these events. And where journalism is unable to bear witness to great atrocities, often they accelerate and deepen, and the Holocaust might be an example of that. It uh, is so strange to me that you, you use that, bear witness, when it seems to me, maybe because I'm sitting in a television studio, where when we began this program, I fell all over myself and said, please stop the camera so that I can start again and use one word instead of another. Bear witness. Uh, do you think that uh, this democratization has led to uh, our really knowing what's happening, that journalists, not professional journalists, but everyone. I think they. I think they, there. There is a way in which um, amateur um, witnesses with distributed technology, interacting with professional journalists, have increased our eyesight on events that would otherwise be hidden and that matter. That's yeah. the way I would put it. Syria is an example. So right. Um, so let's. I mean, Syria is a, a pretty good case study of the way technology has changed the forms of um, foreign correspondent that involve simply documenting um, political violence in real time and attempting to uh, provide as accurate and full a real-time record 
of important forms of political violence that are otherwise closed off to the world as it's possible to do. Now, I would rather have the amateur video and the cell phone photographs and the, um, and the ability to speak by Skype to eyewitnesses uh, on the ground and the ability of uh, amateur journalists to document uh, grave sites and mass grave sites and to attempt to create a first draft of records of shellings of civilian areas and so forth than not. I'm not telling you that that's a substitute for professional journalism, but it's a resource and it's not irrelevant. It's a form of, of participation in the way media works today that um, I think is important. It's inevitable and I don't regard it as something to be afraid of or to be you know, to, as, as some sort of devolution of journalism. It's, but I'm not suggesting that it's adequate. It's, it's important. It's something new. And it, when it's uh, vetted, reviewed, and interrogated by professional journalists who are experienced enough and have the resources to sort wheat from chaff, to be skeptical about all claims, to uh, even be skeptical about photographs and images that yeah. are carried out by activists, to, you know, to, to do all of the things that a good professional journalist would do. Nonetheless, they now have access to a world of witnesses that technology has enabled. And I think that's constructive. I love your enthusiasm, and I think that's great for Columbia's journalism students now. I, I, uh, it doesn't make much difference what I think about that, but I do have to go back to uh, your publication, The New Yorker, and by gosh, I didn't realize it was quite that long ago. It was March 1989 that Janet Malcolm first wrote her wonderful Reflections, The Journalist and the Murderer. It began with that incredible paragraph Every journalist who is not too stupid or too full of himself to notice what is going on knows that what he does is morally indefensible. He is a kind of confidence man preying on people's vanity, ignorance, or loneliness, gaining their trust and betraying them without remorse. Like the credulous widow who wakes up one day to find the charming young man and all her savings gone, so the consenting subject of a piece of non-fiction writing learns, when the article or book appears, his hard lesson. Journalists just justify their treachery in various ways according to their temperaments. The more pompous talk about freedom of speech and the public's right to know. The least talented talk about art. The seemliest murmur about earning a living. Now, <laughs> it still holds up all these years later. You'd say it still holds up all as these a piece years of writing, later. not as a piece of observation necessarily. But it doesn't hold up as a piece of observation necessarily. Do you th do you really believe that? Well, it's a look. It's a provocation. It's quite a wonderful um, paragraph. One of the great first paragraphs in the history of the New Yorker, and I'm sure that the author uh, intended it both honestly and with tongue ever so slightly in cheek. I I you know I. I think, um, first of all, um, one thing that's changed between 1989 and 2013 in the relationship between journalists and subjects, which is what she's really getting right. at here, and of course this is a particularly poisoned instance, the McGinnis uh, murder case, and then Errol Morris just came out with a book that goes back over the same poisoned ground and comes to entirely different conclusions. So. Let's just set that aside as a as a kind of exaggerated Too good to example. Set aside. <laughs> Too but, good to say. But in any event, I don't remember. The, I, I read Fatal Vision, and I'm aware of er Errol's uh, recent book, and but I I don't recall the facts well enough to go through them chapter and verse. But, but you know it, journalism. I do know journalism, and so one thing I wanted to say is that I noticed this in my own practice of journalism. Um, I started out. Uh, in 1980, when I got out of college, and I was quite influenced by that uh, piece because I'd read *Fatal Vision* and I was aware of of how that book, the relationship between the author and the subject who thought he was innocent of a 
of a murder and had engaged with the journalist in order to be proven innocent, ended up with a book that was quite different from what he thought he was getting. And I was a young journalist. And then I, I read this stunning paragraph that essentially uh, described the profession that I was now well embarked on as morally indefensible. So I, you know, this, is, this has been a generational influence to me. But I, I have to say, in the practice of journalism myself, one big thing that's changed um, because of electronic media and because of the way media has saturated our culture and our society is that I don't think uh, subjects are anywhere near as naive as they were um, in the 1980s. Now, you can still have people who will talk themselves into a fallacy out of ego or vanity and the, and the things that she's observed, yes. But uh, I find that the subjects that I approach, whether they are um, ordinary citizens who I'm tracking down because I'm trying to piece together some biography in a small town and I'm encountering people who don't normally deal with reporters, or I'm dealing with a sophisticated subject who may be in government office and who sees the New Yorker coming and is trying to figure out what kind of jujitsu they're going to play with the New Yorker. It, on both ends of the spectrum, naive sources and sophisticated sources, what has changed uh, is that they are themselves media players. They see themselves as media savvy. They think they know the game. They uh, recognize that they have a role to play. They have to decide what version of that role they want to play. They'll start spewing out ground rules jargon. I'll do it on deep background, but with the right to clear quotes. To back. I mean, and none of that was around in the 1980s. Now, I'm not saying it's better or worse, but it's quite different. Uh, I, and I also think uh, then, now I'm going to sound earnest and make myself vulnerable to uh, the Janet Malcolm uh, sort of cynicism. In a half minute. In a half minute. It is possible to practice ethical journalism if you work at it. You don't have to betray your subjects. That's not even a half minute. It's a great <laughs> conclusion. And we're coming within seconds of the end of our program. So I've got to ask you to stay around and do this second program uh, with me. All I can say is I think you're being terribly naive in your conclusion about the difference between then and now. The subject is still as much taken in, not necessarily purposefully, but because of his or her, her own limitations by the fact somebody's going to write a story about me and what I think. Let's pick it up next time. Okay. okay. Thank you. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time as well. Meanwhile, as an old friend used to say, good night and good luck. And do visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash openmind Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.